All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I am joined by Chris Benson, who is in Roswell in Georgia. How are you doing, Chris? I'm doing great. How are you today, John? Excellent. And Chris is the Chief Investment Officer at Reliant Investments and oversees the equity raising arm of the business, sits on the investment committee and manages investor relations. And what we wanted to talk today about is something that Reliant specializes in and maybe a part of the real estate investment market that some people may not be that familiar with, and that is self-storage. Um, so, Chris, uh, I was looking at uh, I was looking at the FAQs on one of your you know recent funds or the funds you have out right now, and you're saying that self storage is a great opportunity in this particular you know this particular circumstance that we're in COVID and that. So, why is self storage probably a good place to start looking at? Yeah, so I mean, John, we're recording this in the beginning of October, yeah. kind of still mid swing of of COVID. Um, knock on wood, our asset class has been relatively unaffected. Um, I think inherently, if you look at it from a macro view, um, Americans don't like to get rid of stuff. <laughs> yeah. But it is. In, in good times, you know, people buy more stuff and they end up having to put it somewhere. And in bad times, um, I think there's a couple things that happen. Um, we, we talk about the four Ds of self-storage demand, um, death, dislocation, divorce, and downsizing. So mm -hmm. unfortunately, um, or fortunately, I guess for us, during a pandemic like this, there seems to be a lot of all of those. And so inherently, um, self-storage seems to benefit. So you know, occupancies have stayed strong and, and generally, uh, we've been relatively unaffected, certainly compared to things like hospitality or retail sale. Yeah, and I mean, in that sense, the reason, if you think about it, obviously, I mean, as you said, uh, the four Ds, but there's a lot of downsizing going on right now. And obviously, people um, are, I mean, and, you know, people are looking to utilize their space in more efficient ways. So it stands to reason that they would be looking to use storage. And as you say, it does, it definitely does seem to be a characteristic in this country of accumulation of things. Uh, I notice, uh, you know, it's a very hard thing for people to give stuff away. So they just tend to accumulate and accumulate. And, and, uh, and so uh, is, this a, is this a market in self-storage? Is this, even at this time, are we seeing more and more units come on stream? Yeah, for sure. Are you referencing as far as new supply coming to the market? Yeah, new supply come to the market. Yeah, yeah I mean, John, in the last five years, self-storage has performed very well historically as an asset class. Um, it performed very well in the last economic downturn, 2007, 8, and 9. And so when things like that happen, capital is always going to find yield. Right. And so there's going to be more capital chasing these deals. Um, there's been a substantial uh, development cycle in the asset class for the last five years. Probably the biggest risk um, short term in the asset class is, you know, you own a facility in a market and someone decides to build a couple down the street or one down the mm -hmm. road. Um, you know, that always basic supply and demand. You got a whole bunch of new supply. Prices are coming down and affects your ability to drive revenue to the facility. So. Um, yeah, we're, we're definitely, things have slowed substantially in the 2019, 2020, um, but we're, we're, you know, we're probably still going to see, you know, new development in the space, just like you would in any asset class. Mm -hmm. So um, for, for somebody who has never considered getting into an asset class like this, um, Chris, what are some of the advantages that you would see of investing in this space? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the first question a lot of our investors ask themselves is, do they want to be a direct investor or a passive investor, mm -hmm. right? Direct meaning, yeah. John, like, you know, you're going to go out and buy your own facility and run yeah. it. Um, you know, passive investor meaning you're partnering with a professional operator and, uh, you know, you're, you're writing a check and hoping that their expertise is going to deliver the returns. Um, you know, I think there, there's some inherent advantages to investing in real estate, right? There's a lot of tax efficiencies. Um, along with investing in real estate. Um, the IRS allows for depreciation, which many times can offset the income that you're actually earning. And there's some ways through 1031 exchange, et cetera, on the back end of how you can continue to roll those gains and essentially never pay tax on them. Um, you know, I think the other thing that many of our investors are interested in is just the idea that it's non-correlated to the traditional equities market. So as you see volatility in the stock market up and down, although as of late, we've seen a lot of up, um, mm -hmm. values in, in real estate 
typically are not following that. So values in real estate are based off of um, income. And so as long as you can have consistent income, then you know, values will stay pretty constant. So I think it depends on everyone as an investor's personal situation and what their goals are for their, for their capital. Um, but generally people are coming to us because they want access to an asset class that's non-correlated to the market and, and have some tax efficiencies uh, along the way. And, uh, and, uh, and in terms of t time frame, is this, this is a longer term investment or, I mean, I presume if you get into this, this is a kind of a longer term investment, but that, that pays along the way? Yeah, I mean, specific for like Reliance investment offerings, John, um, you know, generally five to seven year hold mm -hmm. is, is generally what we project. Um, there's quarterly distributions along the way, assuming the property can, and you know, the property cash flow calls for that. Um, but yeah, it's something that investors, you know, you, there's two downsides that I would say, if you look to invest with groups like us, mm -hmm. um, you know, one is illiquidity, right? So different than buying a share in like a REIT sure. or real estate investment trust or a stock, you could trade in and out of those daily, highly liquid. Investments with us are illiquid and hopefully we pay you a premium for that illiquidity. Um, but then the second part of it too, is you really have no control. And I don't mean to sound crass as I'm saying this, mm -hmm. but you're at the will of the operator because we yeah. can do whatever we want. And, and really, I think that's where it speaks to you're really investing in the people behind the business versus, you know, the, the actual real estate itself. Certainly it's important, but what's more important is the team who's going to be running it for the next, you know, call it five to seven years. Yeah. So basically then if you're an investor, one of the, the couple of things that you need to consider here is number one, yes, you know, you'll get a, you'll get payments along the way, but you need to, know that your funds are kind of locked up for the next like five to seven years as you say so that should be money that you're okay with being illiquid for that period of time and then the second thing as you said is finding somebody who's got a track record and who you can trust to management because you are outsourcing this to someone else i think you're 100 percent spot on with that yeah. Um, so what is the, so the typical, is there a typical investor who invests in your funds? Is there a typical profile of investor or is it really open to anybody who's got the funds and maybe wants, as you say, to try something different, to try something that's not uh, locked into the, to the markets? So with, with us specifically, um, our investments require investors to be accredited. Um, so mm -hmm. the PC has a, uh, a guideline for an accredited investor, which typically means, you know, you have income over the last two years of either two or $300,000 a year and expect to make that for the future. Um, or you have a net worth above a million dollars, um, mm -hmm. not, not including your primary residence. And, and generally most private placements like ours um, have that accredited investor requirement. Um, and you have to, to prove that. Um, and, and I would say that, so that avatar is usually, you know, people who are in a, a, a line of work, perhaps, you know, doctor, lawyer, business owner who have some um, disposable income and looking to diversify into something outside the traditional equities market, um, but generally don't have the time to be a direct investor, as we talked about, right, to go out and how to, you know, buy a self-storage facility, run it, you know, 11, 12 months out of the year. So, um, it most it, there are some uh, for non-accredited investors there are some platforms that do allow um for raising equity that way um and usually in smaller investment minimums as well um so you, you just want to think about that as an it, depending on which category you fall in which which uh which opportunities you may have access to yeah no for sure but basically as you say i mean this isn't an investment for somebody who wants to play with liquid assets and, uh, you know, get in, get out fast and uh, have a quick return. Yeah. I mean, if you're, if you're day trading, um, we're probably not a good fit for it. You know, <laughs> what you're trying yeah. to accomplish. It's more of a longer term appreciate play. Yeah. And what are the, what are the, what are the typical returns like for, um, for a fund, a storage fund, like the one you have uh, going on right now? Yeah, I mean, I could speak to, to our deals, you know, generally, John, like for, for this particular fund, we're projecting it to be a six year hold. And over that six years, um, the, the average return should be between 12 and 15% is what we project. Um, and a portion of that is upfront capital that you're getting paid distribution based on the cash flow of the properties. And a portion of that is based off the sale of the portfolio on the back end. Um, and the profit from those sales obviously supplements that return as well. So 
you know, generally kind of that mid-teens type of return is is where we shoot uh, where we shoot for. Yeah, no, it's 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 very good. And as you say, I mean, it's it's one that's perhaps a little bit more, um, if you like. Uh, it's it's um, proof from the, the the swings and the slings and arrows of of the stock market and I mean it's a fairly relative recession proof investment, right? Yeah. Well, if there's if there is such a thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I would say as of October seventh, we seem to be. Um, who knows? Mm -hmm. Three months yeah. frame. Um, but yeah, I, I would argue that relative so, to some other asset classes in real estate. I mean, think about what's happening in the hospitality industry right mm -hmm. now. A hotel investor, you're hurting. Um, and not that there won't be opportunities in the future, but um, generally COVID has impacted hotel retail very strongly. You know, asset classes like self-storage, industrial, right? Think of all the commerce that's happening and yeah. that is getting distributed from um, industrial type property. So, you know, there's been some asset classes that generally have, have fared well through economic downturns and certainly self-storage that data would suggest is one of them. Yeah. And it seems also that uh, self-storage, that it maintains pretty good pricing. Um, I mean, obviously it's dependent on the location and all of that, but generally speaking, I mean, it, it's not, it's not an, it's not a very cheap thing to do to self-storage. I mean, it's got, it's got, uh, you know, monthly fees and all of that, but it seems like the prices to consumers seems to have stayed pretty steady. Yeah. And in some cases, you know, from the consumer side of things, the new supply has benefited them because prices come down, right? If mm -hmm. I open a brand new facility and I'm trying to, to fill it up, sure. you can see up, I'm typically dropping prices to do that. Um, so, you know, I, I would argue that certainly new development helps the consumer in the short term because prices all come down to, to attract um, the majority of consumers. So, um, yeah, it, it, you know, the, the interesting part of storage versus maybe some other asset classes is, you know, when we talk about rent growth, if you're paying 50 bucks a month, 10% rent growth a year sounds like a ton, right? In, you know, in a yeah, park, yeah. that'd be a lot. But in self storage, ten percent of fifty bucks is five bucks a year. Most yeah. people will, you know, sustain that. So um, it's some interesting dynamics that go along with the asset class. Yeah, no, there is. But I mean, I must say, from my own personal experience, I mean, I don't. There never seems to be that great a, a differential in prices when you from in a particular area. Yeah, when somebody new comes on stream and maybe does new specials. But pretty quickly, they all seem to level out at a fairly, you know, stable price. Yeah, I think that's probably true, especially as they, you mentioned the word stable. As properties start to stabilize, everybody's prices kind of come up to what we would consider a market rate. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Are there, I mean, I know you specialize in, in storage. Are there, any, are there other uh, commercial real estate or other classes that you, that you also focus on? No, so, so Reliant is a one-trick pony. Um, mm -hmm. We're the integrated self-storage operator, so we just buy and manage self-storage properties, um, primarily in the southeastern part of the United States. I mean, we have 50 properties across eight states. Um, so that's that's all we do, and from an investment standpoint, all we mm -hmm. in. Yeah, so if somebody is interested here, you are somebody who focuses 100% on this particular market, and you've you know gathered your expertise in it, because as you said earlier, um, that's the two things that you have to bear in mind. Number one is, you know, your funds are illiquid for a period of time. And second off, that you're handing it off to somebody to manage this on your behalf. So working with somebody like yourselves who have the domain expertise and this is all you do is obviously a you know, pretty smart way to go. Yeah, I mean, I, and, and I've done a fair amount of passive investing with, with mm -hmm. other personally. And, you know, I think the thing, like you said, John, I, I want to know that that's what you live, breathe and eat you know, um, is whatever it is I've given you money to invest in. You know, not, not to say that multi-asset strategies aren't mm -hmm. go well, there certainly are. Um, but like, like, you know, it's, it's easier to be an expert in one thing um, versus a little bit in a lot of things. No, absolutely, absolutely. And I think uh, given, the, uh, given the situation that we're in and the uncertainty of the future, I think it's always a good strategy for people to be looking at different in investment vehicles um, to, and to try and hedge as best as you can uh, when the future's uncertain. So I think looking at maybe something like storage, which 
some people may never have thought about before, I think is a, is, is a great idea to, uh, to investigate these other vehicles. I'm biased, but I think I agree with you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that, alternative, that alternative investment space, and, and not just real estate, but you know, if you think outside the traditional stocks and bonds portfolio, mm -hmm. most wealth managers are going to push into, um, that alternative investment space has gained a lot of momentum over the past 10 to 15 years, not, not just with individual investors, but also sure. at the institutional level, you know, endowments, pension funds are starting to deploy capital for that same diversification that you're talking about. Yeah, no, I, I think I think it's a great idea to to be as a, to be diversified, but also to to investigate different um, alternative vehicles as well. I think uh, because as we've seen, who knows who knows the stock market. It's great when it's we're having these great runs up, but uh, as we've seen, it's an extremely volatile place and can can turn on a dime literally. It has to correct eventually, John. It's not a question of if, when, and how bad and how long. Um, yeah. It's coming. <laughs> And when it does, there there'll probably be people putting a lot more stuff in storage. <laughs> <laughs> also, it be true. Maybe a benefit for us. Yeah. yeah. All right. Listen. Thanks very much, Chris. This has been uh, this has been fascinating. You know, as I said, uh, shining a light into a subject that many people um, who watch this may not have uh, heard of before or may not have thought about before. All of Chris's information and reliance information will be in the contributor bio. But before we go, Chris, do just tell us a little more about yourself and what your company does. Um, yeah, as we had mentioned, um, I'm the CIO of Reliant Real Estate Management. Reliant Real Estate Management is a um, self storage, vertically integrated self storage operator located out of Roswell, Georgia. So essentially, that just means we're buying and managing self storage properties um, across the southeastern United States. Yeah, and you have a and you have a, a fund open right now. Yeah, uh, we're currently raising equity in a vehicle called Reliant Self Storage Fund Two. Um, which essentially the easiest way to think about it, John, think about like a mutual fund of self-storage mm -hmm. property. As an right. investor, you know, you're investing at the fund level and you will be an owner of all of the properties that the fund buys. So hopefully provide some diversification and safety for investors if, if one particular market gets hit um, with new supply, for example, or some sort of economic event, it will be, the performance would be buoyed by the remaining properties in the portfolio. Yeah, and it sounds like a great if you're if you're looking to enter this for the first time, it sounds like a great way to go in and in, in something like this, where as you say, it's kind of like a mutual fund of storage, like it. All right, well, listen. Thanks again, Chris. Thank you for being with us today. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Thanks again, Chris, and thank you all for joining us. Yeah, my pleasure. Hope you have a great rest of the day, John.